Hey team, Dr. Jack Audien, in this video I'm going to be taking you through the Chamberlain filter. Now trust me when I tell you it's not just a filter and it changed the course of history. And I'm also going to explain how it contributed to the discovery of viruses. So let's jump into it. Well, Cha the Chamberlain filter is named after Charles Chamberlain. Now he worked with Louis Pasteur. Um, around 1884 during the rise of germ theory and Louis Pasteur discovering the yeast and bacterial causes of food going off and beer going off sort of being the founder of microbiology. Um, now they had a problem they wanted to filter their solutions and through the filtration process ensure that there was no bacteria or yeast in that liquid but the filters at the time weren't designed well. Um, so there, were, there, there was a common filter, which is essentially a funnel with filter paper or filter material in there. And we still use this today. I use this today every now and then, not for filtering our bacteria, but other things. Um, but there's a problem. Uh, paper does not stop bacteria, especially after multiple uses. You can't use it multiple times. It breaks down. If you're trying to do a lot of liquid, the paper actually breaks. Um, and materials the same. They don't stop the bacteria and they can actually sort of harbor bacteria in themselves. Um, and it's a small surface area. If you look here, the liquid is actually only flowing through a very small surface area there. What that means is it's easy to get clogged and also it's a bit of a traffic jam for the molecule. So it's really slow. The liquid drips out the bottom. It's incredibly slow. And there's no pressure being applied. We're just using gravity here. And it's again a very weak pressure. So again, that makes it very slow. So these are the problems that Charles Chamberlain and Louis Pasteur sought to overcome. So paper is not a good barrier. How'd they come across how'd they overcome that? Well, they decided on using porcelain filters. Now porcelain, as in what we make bowls out of, you might think that that, hold on a minute, isn't that waterproof? That doesn't seem like a very good filter. Well, it's actually the gloss that we apply to that porcelain that makes it 100% waterproof. And you can kind of see that when you break porcelain, it's kind of porous on the inside. Now these pores can be made very tiny in good porcelain, so tiny in fact that bacteria cannot fit through. It's also incredibly hard, it can be heated which allows it to be sterilized, and so it's reusable. It's a, it's a fantastic thing to make a good filter out of. So how did they come over the small, how did they overcome the small surface area problem? So here's a picture of an actual Chamberlain filter, and it may look like there's not a lot of surface area in here, but let's cut that in half and have a look at the innards of the filter. It looks like this. So we've got a fluid intake here, then we've got our porcelain filter here, and then we have a fluid outflow here. So the liquid comes in here, it fills up, and then it goes through the porcelain from all around it. It surrounds it. So this actually has a very large surface area that allows the filter to work really well. Now the last thing is pressure. So they, um, Chamberlain and Pasteur, they put pumps on to pressurize the liquid to allow it to get through even faster. Um, and also they developed a model that could hook up to the town's water supply like this and the town's water supply applies the pressure, right? You imagine a water tower is really high up which provides the pressure for the water. Now, this is what we do in the lab today. Um, we use these sterilizing filters here and what you can see here, there's huge similarities with the Chamberlain filter. We've essentially copied it and we're still using it today. And we use it for the same reason. We want to create solutions that are sterile that don't have the bacteria and yeast in. Now, instead of making it out of porcelain, we typically make it out of nylon because we make everything out of plastic these days. It's incredibly cheap. Probably not good for the environment, let's be honest. Um, but you can see here we've got this big disc here and that's to increase the surface area and the same thing's going on. The fluid's going in and it's spreading out across the surface of that disc to increase the surface area. Then of course we use syringes typically to apply that pressure. So we still use the Chamberlain filters basically today. So let's go over some of those benefits. Well, it prevented deaths as these systems were put into personal and town drinking supplies, which were often contaminated 
with bacteria. So it's prevented deaths as soon as they um, developed this and it went widespread. It provided more evidence for the germ theory because essentially they showed that when you filter, uh, when you take a pus sample, for example, of someone with a bacterial disease and you filter it and it gives that to an animal, the animal doesn't contract the disease. So you can filter out the cells and by filtering out the cells, you prevent the disease transmission. So it provides more evidence for germ theory, which was the big battle at the time. Um, it's also an excellent research tool. It makes those sterilized um, fluids, which are essential for a lot of research, which is still in use today. Uh, but also, and critically, it led to the discovery of viruses. So I might have given away at how that occurred. Now, the first virus identified essentially was the tobacco mosaic virus, and this is essentially what happened. They went to essentially prove the germ theory. So here we have an infected leaf, and here we have an uninfected leaf. They mushed up the infected leaf, and you can apply it to an unaffected leaf, and it will become infected. So now, to prove germ theory, all we have to do is do that again. Um, but put it through the filter, which should filter out all the germs, all the cellular germs, and then we can apply it to the leaf, and it shouldn't cause a disease. So we should be free from disease. But it did, it did cause disease. Now, being plant biologists, um, and not quite as smart and brilliant as human biologists, I shouldn't say that, I was a plant biologist. I did my honors in uh, plant viruses, in fact, before I went on to mammalian biology. Uh, plants are great. They're hugely under, uh, underrated. Plants are amazing. Um, but because perhaps they weren't familiar, as familiar and committed to germ theory as many of the um, human biologists, they concluded that maybe there is such a thing as a disease liquid. Perhaps it is a liquid form that's causing the disease. But this was... This whole process was essentially re repeated for foot and mouth disease in cattle, which was a common infection at the time. It caused a big hoorah in England a few years back. Um, and they essentially got the same result. Now, these scientists concluded it's probably a germ that's just incredibly small. It makes, it makes sense that it's still got that replicating capacity. And we've given up on miasma, which is bad gases. So bad liquid sounds way too much like miasma, bad gases. So we still think that there's probably some sort of cell or entity in there. Um, and that is when it got named a virus. And that's when we discovered those particles. Now, we discovered a lot about viruses in the coming years, what they were made out of. We found that they were made out of very similar things to us, but we didn't get to see them until the invention of the electron microscope. So in the next video, I'm going to go over the electron microscope.